Hi, my name is Daniel Roy. I'm a sleight of hand magician and I'm a senior at the University of Pennsylvania studying neurobiology. And just like the rest of the world, I'm stuck inside right now. With the recent coronavirus outbreaks, the whole performing arts industry is pretty much on pause and magic is no exception. So while I'm here and everyone else is in their own place, I figured I might as well offer up a magic trick for people to learn. Uh, hopefully it'll brighten up your day a little bit and take your mind off the world events. And if you practice it, you'll be able to perform it for all your friends over, over video chat. If you've ever been scared to learn how to do a magic trick, now's your chance. Uh, grab a deck of cards. It doesn't have to be a new deck. It can be an old beat-up deck. It doesn't matter. Uh, I will perform the trick, and then I will explain all the various steps and techniques that you'll need to be able to do this for your friends. I'll start by giving the cards some shuffles, and if there happens to be anyone co-isolating with you, they can shuffle the cards as well, as many times as they want. Now, as I spread through these cards, I just want you to touch one on the back, and I'll spread through them slowly. So let's say they point to this one here. So this will be the selected card. So I will look away, and I want you to memorize that card. Lock that card in your memory. Got it? Great. Now, uh, I'll cut some cards down to the table, be about here. And I want you to drop the card back, and I'll put the rest on top. In fact, you can square the cards up if you want to. Now, would you do me a favor? I want you to cut over about half the deck like it's done in the game, and then put the rest on top. In fact, if you want to cut the deck again, you can do so. And you can have other audience members do this as well. You could have another person come up. If they want to cut the deck, they can cut the deck. If another person wants to come up and, and do so, they can cut the deck as well. As many times as they want. Now, I'm going to take out a uh, pair of cards. Uh, how about I'll take out the red kings? You didn't pick a red king, did you? Okay, good. So I will go through the deck, and I will take out the two uh, red kings. So the first one is the uh, king of diamonds, and the second one uh, should be the king of hearts. King of diamonds and the king of hearts. Now, in a moment, I'm going to count to three. Would you be impressed if the instant I reach the number three your card materialized in between the two red kings? That'd be pretty amazing, right? The instant I reach the number three, your card will be in between the two red kings. Here goes. One, two, three. Done. Because there's one red king on the top of the deck, then there's every single card in the deck, and then there's another red king on the bottom. So technically speaking, your card is in between the two red kings, right? But usually people aren't very impressed, so I have to do it for real. One red king on the top, the other red king on the bottom. In just an instant, you'll see one card materialize in between the kings, and with any luck, it should be your eight of spades. So, now I'm going to explain exactly how to do this trick. In order to do so, I'll need to walk you through all of the various sleight of hand techniques that are used. The very first thing you need to learn how to do is how to hold the deck of playing cards. This is going to be the most boring thing you'll ever learn, but I promise it's well worth your while. There are two main ways that cards are held. The first is called left hand dealing position. Um, the cards are held in my left hand. This edge of the deck is against the base of the thumb. The index finger is at the front, the thumb is on the side, and there are three fingers along this side. The tips of all of these three fingers here are in line with the top card of the deck. In other words, they're not sticking out too far, nor are they too far down. They're in line with the top card of the deck, as is the index finger, and this side of the deck is uh, resting not too deeply against the base of the thumb. Now, in terms of how tightly or loosely you want to hold the cards, a good metaphor is to imagine that the cards are a bird. You want to hold the bird tightly enough that it can't fly away, but not so tightly that you crush the wings. The next grip is what's called right hand end grip. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to take the left index finger and you're going to extend it underneath the deck. Now, you're going to take the right hand and you're going to take your right thumb and it's going to go at the back of the deck, right here, right along the middle. And then you're going to take three fingers, these three fingers, the second, third, and fourth finger, and these go along the outer edge. Now notice that the thumb and these fingers protrude below the uh, edge of the deck. 
So you're going to lift the cards out of your hand and you'll also notice that the index finger curls on top. You don't want to curl it too much, you just want the nail of the index finger down against that top card. So this is called a right hand end grip. Now, a lot of people when they start doing this, they're kind of holding it up like this with the fingers all spread out. Try to rotate the hand down slightly to bring these fingers together. So the cards are held like this. Now, you need to put the cards back into dealing grip. So you're going to take the deck and you're going to align it with the base of the hand here, just like before. Then these three uh, fingers are going to come up along this side and then the thumb comes, or the index finger I should say, comes to the outer edge and the cards are back in dealing position. And now you're just going to spend a few minutes doing this very simple exercise where you move the index finger down, the thumb comes at the back, three fingers at the front, index finger curls at the top, and you pick the deck up, and then you put the cards back into dealing position in exactly the same way. And really stop each time and make sure your grip is correct on the cards before going on. Now in terms of how you want to practice this, uh, in general, imagine that your hands are submerged in a pot of honey. You want to practice at that speed, so you really want to do this at about this speed initially. You just do this again and again, just for a few minutes, and you can slowly ramp up uh, to, a, to a more workable speed. One thing you should keep in mind about learning these grips is that even though it might seem kind of pedantic to en enforce such specific finger positioning at this early stage, if you don't learn these grips correctly and then you try to learn another trick that uses a more advanced sleight of hand technique, you'd have to go back essentially and relearn the grips just so that you could do the more advanced techniques. So it really pays to learn them right the first time around and not have to unlearn bad habits later. So the next thing to learn is how to spread cards between your hands, how to have a card picked. So here's what happens. You start with the cards in left hand dealing position just like before. So that means this edge goes against the base of the palm with the thumb at the side like this, index finger at the outer end, three fingers along the side. Again, the fingertips are just in line with the top card. Now you're going to take the thumb and you're going to start to push the cards over to the side. You're going to let the, just a small group come over the tips of the fingers and you're going to take these in the fork of the right thumb right here. So you're going to take them in the fork of the right thumb, gripping them by clamping them like this. And then you're just going to keep pushing little groups of cards over and these three fingers here of the left hand, the second, third, and fourth fingers, these fingers are going to extend slightly to let more and more cards uh, come over. And so what happens as you do this is as these fingers extend more and more and more, you get to a point where all of your fingers are extended under the cards. And this is what lets you support the cards while they're spread apart like this. If you find that they're uh, tipping back or falling towards you, you can take your pinkies and put them at the back like this just to kind of uh, support them, but you would still keep all three of your other fingers underneath the spread. So once again, they start in dealing position. You use the thumb to push some cards over, letting them kind of pass over these fingertips. You clamp them in the fork of the right thumb, and then you spread out the cards, extending all your fingers underneath the, the, the spread of cards. So you have an audience member uh, take a card out, so let's say they pick this one. And then all you do to square the cards up is the reverse. You just take the right hand's cards and you just kind of shove them over here. And all that's going to happen is you're just going to now re-grip everything in dealing grip. And when you do that, it automatically squares up the cards um, in this direction. And then you just take them in end grip by moving this finger down. And then it automatically squares up the cards in this direction. And if they're still a little unsquared, you can kind of run your fingers along the sides just to be sure. So. Now you're going to let them look at this card, and of course you wouldn't see it, but just for the purposes of explanation, it happens to be a ten of spades. But you would show them the card and you'd make sure they remember it. Now, while they look at the card, you have to do something very simple. All you have to do is look at the bottom card of the deck. Now this is really easy because everyone's watching this card, and you can make a big deal about turning your back. All you have to do is just kind of let your left hand tilt over like this, and if you just let it tilt a little bit, you'll be able to see the index of the uh, bottom card right here. You could also just pick the deck up and end grip like this and just kind of look at the bottom card. No one will be watching you at this point. You'll just be turned away like this. Just take a quick look at the bottom card and put it back in your hand. So in this case, it's the seven of hearts. And this is your key card.
Now, the key card principle is reliant on the fact that a deck of cards is actually like a closed loop. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment. So the selected card is the Ten of Spades. Our key card that we looked at on the bottom is the Seven of Hearts. You're going to cut some cards onto the table, and all you do is you uh, get the index finger out of the way. It's like you're about to take the deck and end grip, but you don't. Instead, you just take the top half of the deck. So your thumb comes in, and it just kind of picks up about halfway uh, through the deck, and you just pick up those uh, top cards, and you put them on the table, and you have the spectator put their card back here. And then you drop the rest of these on top. Now, you wouldn't show this card. I'm just showing this for clarity so you can see that this is the seven of hearts. But again, you would just take the rest of these and put them on top. So what just happened is now the key card, which is the uh, seven of hearts, is right above the selected card, which is the ten of spades. So your key card is right next to the selected card. So even though you don't know the selected card, you do know that it's right next to the key card on this side. Now, here's what I mean. Now, the key card principle is based off of the fact that a deck of cards is actually like a closed loop. And when you give the cards a square cut or a straight cut like this, which means you're just taking some cards from the top and putting them on the bottom like that, all it does is it essentially turns the closed loop. It's a cyclical order. So here's what I mean. I can give the deck any number of straight cuts like this, as long as they're just a single straight cut, and the key card will always be next to the selected card. It doesn't matter how many times I cut the deck, the seven of hearts is here, the ten of spades is still right next to it. If I give the cards another cut, it doesn't matter. The seven of hearts and the ten of spades will still be next to each other. Now you might be wondering, what happens if you were to cut the deck right in between these two cards? Well. Then what happens is the seven would be on the bottom and the ten of spades would be on the top. But again, the deck is a cyclical closed loop. So they're still, in a way, right next to each other. So if you ever see that your key card is on the bottom of the deck, that just means the selected card is on the top. And if you were to give the cards another cut, well, they would be right back next to each other somewhere in the middle. So let's assume that this is the situation. The cards have been cut many, many times. Now what you're going to do is you're going to say, I'm going to take out a pair of cards. Uh, why don't I take out uh, the red sevens? Now all you do is you name the pair of cards that includes your key card. So if my key card was the ace of hearts, I would have said the red aces. If it was the five of clubs, I would have said the black fives. Uh, but because uh, the key card was a red seven, because the, red, uh, the key card was the, in this case, the seven of hearts, right? That means I'm going to say, I'm going to take out the red sevens. And I will give the deck a few more cuts just so I don't know uh, for the purposes of explanation exactly where the key card is going to be in the deck. So now what you're going to do is you're going to spread through the cards and look for the red sevens, but you need to spread through them with the cards up towards you like this. So this is just like before. You're pushing some cards over with your thumb into the fork of the right thumb like this but you're going to keep your pinkies behind the cards like this, below them, and this, is, uh, this will help the cards not fall down. So that's the only difference. You keep everything else extended like this. So, but I will, for the purposes of explanation, turn the cards like this. Now, there are two cases. You can either come to the other red seven first, in this case the seven of diamonds, or you can come to your key card first. It really doesn't matter. So if you come to the uh, other red seven, you just take it out of the deck. Um, and then you keep spreading through, and whenever you get to your key card, and again, you would be doing this up here, because otherwise they'd see their selection, but whenever you get to the key card, all you do is you break the spread at that point, so you're breaking the spread in between the key card and the selected card, but again, you're doing it like this, and you're giving the deck a cut, which brings the key card to the face and the selected card to the back. But you do that all right here, and then you would just turn the deck like this and then take out the seven and put it on the table. So what it looks like is that you just took out the two red sevens. But in the process, you controlled the selected card to the top of the deck. So now that we have the two red sevens out on the table and the selected card on top, 
we actually need to control the selected card to the bottom. And it's helpful at this point to be able to shuffle the deck uh, because we did just kind of look through all the cards, so it might dispel some suspicion if we give the cards a shuffle. Now first I'm going to teach how to do the shuffle legitimately, but then I will explain a small modification that allows us to control the card. So just forget about the selected card for a moment. Here's the overhand shuffle, and I'll leave these out of the way. You hold the cards in left-hand dealing position, and you're now going to tilt the hand up, which means you take this hand and you tilt it up so that these fingernails point upwards. And now you're going to take the right thumb and bring it to the back of the deck. But instead of going around the center, you're going to come nearer to the top, nearer this corner right here. And then the right uh, middle finger will go at the outer edge like this. So they're not in the center, they're more towards this side. And the index finger is just going to be on top. Now, you're going to take your left hand and your left thumb and you're going to reach up and just uh, to, the, to the edge right here and just pull off a group of cards. And then you just let these cards rest on these fingertips. You don't hold them, you don't take them in dealing position. They rest along the crease of the hand right here and they just rest on these fingertips. And you'll usually want to have your index finger kind of at the front so that you can lean the hand forward and have the cards not fall. Again, they're not held, they're just caged, the thumb is away. Now what happens is the right hand comes back over, and these cards stay here, they do not get taken by the left hand, they just stay in, or they do not get taken by the right hand, they stay in the left hand. And you take the left thumb and you bring it up to the top again, and you pull off more cards like this. And you'll notice as I pull off more cards, they're just going on top of the cards that were already in this hand. And then you do it again. You reach up with the thumb and you pull off some more cards. And then you pull off more cards and more cards until you just have a few left and you throw them on top. So once again, you start in dealing position. You tilt the hand up like this, right thumb at the back, middle finger at the front. And all you're gonna do is take the left thumb, pull off a small group of cards, let them rest on the fingers like this. Again, they're along the crease of the hand here with the index finger at the front. The right hand comes over and you just pull off groups of cards more and more until you get to the very end and you throw the rest on top. Now I'm going to show you how to do what's called running cards. And all that means is that as you give the cards an overhand shuffle, like this, at some point instead of having the thumb come up to the top of the cards, just put the thumb on the back of a card. And when you put the thumb on the back of a card, you'll notice that you just pull the card off singly. And this is just because of the friction of the thumb. So if the thumb goes onto the back of a card, you just pull off one card. If it goes up to the very top, you'll be able to pull off a group of cards. And you can control this. Whenever you want to pull off one card, you can just put the thumb on the back and run one card singly. And whenever you want to pull off a group, you just bring the thumb up to the top. So that's all there is to it pulling off single cards or groups of cards. Now the way that we're going to use this is very simple because the selected card is the ten of spades and I'll just move it back to the top because this is where it would be at this point. All you're going to do is tilt the hand up like this, take it into position for an overhand shuffle. The left thumb comes to the uh, back of this top card and you just pull off this top card singly on its own, which is the selected card, but they don't know that. And then you just give the rest of the deck an overhand shuffle on top of it, which means that card should now be on the bottom. So once again, the selected card was on top. All you do is you tilt the hand up, grip the deck for an overhand shuffle between the right thumb and the right middle finger, and then the left thumb goes to the back of the top card, pulls one card off, and again, it just rests here. It does not get taken by this hand. It just stays in this hand. And then you just pull off groups of cards on top of it like this. And now this moves the selected card to the bottom. So once it's here, just regrip the cards in dealing position. Make sure no one sees the bottom card. So now that the selected card has been controlled to the bottom of the deck, uh, it's time to do the little joke. So you say something along the lines of, well, I'm going to count to three, and would you be impressed if, when I reach the number three, your card materializes in between the two red sevens? And of course, they'll say yes, that would be a miracle. So you say, okay, the instant I reach the number three, your card will be in between the two red sevens. So you count to three. In fact, you could even have them count to three if you want to. 
And as you're counting to three, you just take one red seven and you just, I'm holding them right now between my thumb and my fingers like this. You can hold them however you want to, it really doesn't matter. All you do is you just take one of the sevens and you just use your left thumb to pull it onto the top of the deck, face up, and you just kind of square it up. And then you just take the other seven and you just stick it onto the bottom. And it can be helpful if you want to just kind of hold the deck with these three fingers. You can get these two fingers out of the way and just slide it into the bottom and then you just push it in. Um, and when they get to three, you say, well, your card's in between the sevens because there's one seven on the top of the deck and then you just spread the cards in between your hands like we learned before. And there's every single card in the deck in between the top seven and the bottom seven, which means your card is in between the two red sevens. Now, they'll have to agree that that's the case, but they usually won't be impressed. So to actually find the card, you do what's called a friction toss. Here's the friction toss. We have one red seven on top, we have another red seven on the bottom, and the selected card, the ten of spades, has been controlled to the bottom of the deck. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to take the deck into right-hand end grip like this, and you're now going to take the, right, uh, the left fingers, the left fingertips here, and you're going to pull the bottom card to the side. Just using friction, you're just going to pull the bottom card to the side. In this case, this is the face-up seven of diamonds. So you just reach under, and you pull this card over for about maybe a third of its uh, width. So this exposes some of this card, but again, you wouldn't show this. You keep the hand face down like this. And now you're going to regrip everything in the left hand. Here's how you're going to do it. You want the pads of these fingers to be against the ten of spades. The pads of these fingers here against the ten of spades. The base of the palm contacts the seven of diamonds right here, like this, and then the left thumb contacts the very top seven. So the only cards that are being contacted by your skin are the seven of hearts, the seven of diamonds, and the ten of spades. Everything else is basically free. So if you turn your hand this way, slightly at a diagonal, and you get your other hand ready to catch, all you're going to do is you're going to keep pressure on these three cards, but you're going to slowly release pressure on all the rest of the cards, and you'll find that at a certain point, they all fall out into your hand, except for the ten of spades, which will stay in between the two sevens. Now this may take you a few tries, and that's okay, but eventually you'll be able to get it so that, again, one red seven on top, another on the bottom, you use these four fingers, you pull this card to the side. These fingers now go in contact with the actual selected card here. The base of the palm contacts this card. The thumb contacts this card. And then you will just keep contact with these three cards, but then slowly release pressure until the rest of the deck falls. Now, once you get good at that, you can start to do it in a tossing motion. And you just want kind of a sharp tossing motion. And you'll catch them in this hand. Uh, and that card will stay behind, and it will be in between the two red sevens, and you say, one card materializes in between the sevens, and it should be your ten of spades. So, I'll go through the friction toss just one more time. One red seven on the top, one red seven on the bottom. You pull this card over with the fingers to the left. These fingers go here in contact with the actual selected card. The thumb is on top. The base of the palm contacts this seven, and then you're either going to tilt as you're learning it, or just give the cards a sharp toss. The only card that stays behind is the card that was uh, in contact with these fingers, which is of course going to be their selected card. So that's the friction toss. So now I'm going to run through the entire trick again, but I'll explain what I'm doing as I'm going along. But I will go through it a little bit slower than, of course, I did in the original performance. So, start by having the cards shuffled by someone else, and then take the cards back and hold them in the left hand dealing position. And again, this means this side of the deck is against the base of your thumb and the thumb itself, the index finger is at this edge, and three fingers run along this side here. And the tips of the fingers are in line with the top of the deck, and there should be some space under the deck here. So. You're now going to spread the cards between your hands. That means you take your left thumb and you're going to use it to push groups of cards over these fingertips, which means you have to extend these fingertips a little bit. And you're going to take these in the fork of the right thumb, and then you're going to keep pushing cards over as you extend all of your fingers under the spread. Usually having your pinkies at the back can help stabilize everything. 
you have a card picked, and as they look at the card and as they memorize it, all you do is you just look at whatever the bottom card is. So in this case, it happens to be the eight of hearts. Um, but you know, just because in the previous uh, explanation the key card was a uh, red seven, why don't I use a different card? Let's say the two. So let's imagine the key card is a, is a black two this time, just for variety's sake. So the key card is the two of spades, and I would look at that as I turn away. And in this case, the selected card happens to be the six of spades. But again, I wouldn't know that. So you hold the deck in dealing position. You are going to extend this finger under the deck like this, and the right hand comes over as if you're about to take everything in end grip, but you don't. The right thumb just lifts up about half the deck from the back. These three fingers come to the front, and the index finger curls on top, and you lift up about half the deck, and you put about half the deck on the table. They put their card back here, and you drop the rest on top, which means you are putting your key card, the two of spades, right on top of the selected card, the six of spades. They just don't know that you have a key card. So now you ask if the audience members want to square the deck up, and they can. Now you're going to offer them the ability to cut the deck. Now, the wording here is important. I always say something like, uh, why don't you cut over some cards like it's done in a game? And the reason I say that is because I don't want them to some start just giving the deck like multiple cuts like this, because they can't do that. That could actually ruin the trick and it wouldn't work. Um, but they don't know that. So you need to create the impression that they have all the freedom in the world when they actually have a lot of restrictions that they just don't know about. So what I say is, would you cut over some cards like it's done in a game? Because that's really only the first half of the instruction. That just means cut over a group of cards. And then I say, okay, and then put the rest of the cards on top. Now they understand what cut the deck means. So you can say, and why don't you give the cards another cut just like before? And they do it again. And you can even have someone else, uh, if there happen to be more people co-isolating with you, because why not? Uh, you can even have someone else come up and uh, give the cards a cut like this, and another person cut the cards, because remember, a deck of cards is a closed cyclical loop, and every time you give the cards a straight cut, you're just turning the loop. So once they've given the cards some cuts, you're going to say, okay, uh, I'm going to take out a pair of cards. Uh, why don't I take out the two black twos? Now the reason I say black twos is because our key card is the two of spades, which means I'm going to say I'm going to take out the two black twos. And then I say, just to check, your card wasn't a black two, was it? Now the reason you have to say this is because if their card was a black two, if they happen to pick the two of clubs, then you can't really do the trick because I can't take out the two black twos and then find their card if their card is a black two. But luckily, this actually isn't the worst case scenario. It's the best case scenario. Because when I say, your card wasn't a black two, was it? If they say, yeah, it was, I say, concentrate on your card. It was the two of clubs, right? You just read their mind because you got very lucky. So in other words, when you say, your card wasn't a, and you name the, the, the cards you're about to take out, if they say, yeah, it was, their card is the other one of the pair. So in other words, if your key card was the three of diamonds, then their card must have been the Three of Hearts. If your key card was the Nine of Spades, their card was the Nine of Clubs. If your key card was the Ten of Diamonds, their card was the Ten of Hearts, and so on and so forth. That will happen very rarely, but it's wonderful when it does happen. So now you're going to turn the cards face up, and you're going to begin to spread through them like this. Uh, but you're going to do it up here uh, with the pinkies below the cards, but just for the purposes of explanation, I will spread through down here. Now, as we look through the cards, there are two scenarios. You can come to your key card first, or the other black two. Um, so in this case, let's see, ah, here it is, the two of spades, our key card. So when you hit your key card, you break the spread between the key card and the one above it, which is their card, and then you cut the cards at this point, bringing their card to the top of the deck. But of course, you do this up here, so that you can then bring the hands down, and put this card onto the table. Then you spread through the cards again up here, and I look for now the two of clubs. And then when I get to the two of clubs, I just put the two of clubs on the table, but I keep everything else in the same order so that their card is still on top of the deck. Now you turn everything face down, and you're going to give the cards an overhand shuffle. So holding everything in dealing grip, you tilt the hand up. Your right thumb comes to the back. The right middle finger comes to the front edge, but they're not in the centers. They're nearer the top index finger goes along the uh, top edge here, and you take your left thumb and you just put it on the back of this top card, and you pull off a single card, letting it rest against these fingers with the index finger at the uh, outer edge, 
and then you just shuffle cards directly on top of it so that their card ends up on the bottom. Now, again, you don't show that. You keep the cards face down and you square them up in dealing position. Now you do the little one, two, three joke. You take the, uh, this card and you put it on top. You take the other two and you put it on the bottom, face up. Now, when you explain that your card, well, it is between the two black twos, you spread the cards uh, between your hands like this just to show the, that the whole deck is in between the twos. Now you hold everything in dealing position, regrip the entire deck in end grip, which means you need to get this finger out of the way. Thumb comes at the back, three fingers at the front, index finger curls on top like this. And now you take the pads of these fingers and you use them to drag this card, but of course holding it down like this, to the left for about a third to half of its width. The pads of these fingers now go in contact with the selected card right here. The base of the hand is in contact with this card, and the left thumb is in contact with the face card. Now, all you do is a sharp toss. One card remains in between the two black twos, and indeed it is their selected card, the six of spades. You should go through the explanation again, and you should look at each individual technique and practice it for a few minutes just to get the feeling, the muscle memory in your hands. And after you've done that, you can then start to work on stringing the various parts of the trick together until you can do the whole thing from memory. You'll definitely want to practice if you have a mirror or a video camera by using that so you can see what everything looks like in your hands. And once you feel confident in that you'll remember all the steps and that you can do the shuffles deceptively and you can nail the friction toss, then you also have to think a little bit about what you're going to say so that you're not you know, stumbling over your words the whole time. And that takes practice, uh, but that's what friends and family are for. You can show them tricks when they're in their early stages and they are usually kind and forgiving audience members. Uh, and they can give you great feedback as well. So I hope you enjoyed learning a magic trick while we're all stuck inside for a little while. I think during times of stress and hardship, this is where entertainment really shines. And it's certainly fun to watch people do magic tricks, but I think it's much more fun to actually learn them yourself and to be able to give that really lovely experience of like, oh my God, how did you do that? That feeling of wonder to other people. So hopefully this will take your mind off world events for a little while and we can all share in some much needed, figuratively and literally, magic. Thanks so much.